Hey there guys, so I'm back again with the Firebat A6. We're gonna be installing Bazite on this system because I want to turn this thing into a little Steam gaming console. Now, unfortunately, SteamOS really isn't ready yet for a desktop release and an OS like Bazite just seems to work better. Specifically, if you're trying to use it as like a home console, Bazite really feels like a more complete product, at least from what I've tested, but we're gonna get Bazite installed on here. Now, I did, upgrade this system. It is currently on sale on AliExpress for $20 off if you use a coupon, but if you end up picking up an extra 16 gigabyte stick to get this thing up to 32 so that you get access to the dual channel memory, that can bump you up to another price tier and you get an even bigger savings in terms of a coupon. It really just depends. Check out the links down below. So a little spoiler, I already went through the entire process of installing Bazite onto here and I just want to give you a warning that could uh, save you some time. If you run through the Bazite installer and it's telling you that there's an active device, essentially that the SSD is in use, that's really a Windows issue. And you, what you have to do is you essentially have to wipe the drive of anything that's on there. There's multiple ways to do this. The way that I do it, I pretty much just boot into the Windows installer, end up opening up the command prompt. From there, I just use this part to select the disk that is the original Windows installation and just clean it. So the clean command will effectively wipe everything on there, including the installation of Windows that it already came with. And from there, I was able to run through the Bazite installation without any more errors. I'm sure there are ways to do this from within Linux itself, but I'm just not familiar with how to do that. But booting into the system itself, it was a pretty great experience overall. Immediately, it boots into the SteamOS interface. That's pretty much how it's configured. And because we're using AMD-based integrated graphics, it works really, really well. Of course, I did have to pair my Bluetooth controller with it. I really wish that there was a way of setting up a Bluetooth controller with the system without having to use a mouse and keyboard, but that really does seem like an impossible ask. But once I got my controller hooked up to it, it really feels like a fantastic console. At least based off of what it says, there's almost 900 games in my game library of 1,383 games that should work with the system. Now, while that's an impressive ratio, a lot of these games are kind of misleading because they don't have full controller support. Many of these games, you're gonna have to use a mouse and keyboard, and that effectively means they're not going to work well, at least for the scenario that I'm thinking of using this for. Hooked up to a TV, I'm just not ever going to play a mouse and keyboard game. But the ones that do have controller support, that's pretty great to see, though, again, some of these titles are just going to be far more demanding than what this little console can realistically do. But the types of games that I play, I don't think it's going to be too much of a problem. So let's just run through some titles just to see how this thing is going to perform. So the first game that I got installed on here was Shadow of War. This is the game running at the medium graphics settings. It wanted to default to high, and I just did not enjoy enjoy what the performance was like at high you were looking at essentially a 30 fps average but not a consistent enough one to justify it dropping down to medium we're looking at more of a 30 to 40 fps gaming experience and while it's not perfect it is at the full 1080p resolution no upscaling or anything is being used here and at the medium graphic settings the game still looks great and overall the performance means that you're able to play this action heavy title without it feeling sluggish. Now this might not be impressive considering that on console to this day it's capped out at 30 FPS. This is already going to get you a better experience than if you were even to play this on the PlayStation 5. Now the next title that I took a look at is Spider-Man Miles Morales and I ran this at the medium graphics settings and we do have the dynamic resolution scaling enabled with a target FPS of 60 and as you can see we're not exactly hitting that number. Still there are a lot of scenarios where it is above 60 and this is one of the most intense scenarios where we're swinging around the city the performance is really fluctuating a ton but when you're doing missions when you're in a confined area when you're in less open areas in general the performance is a very consistent above 60 fps gaming experience so i really would consider this to be a very playable time especially because we're at effectively playstation 4 level of graphics settings at least according to digital foundry the medium 
custom graphics preset on PC is about the most comparable to the PlayStation 4's baseline level of performance. And considering that that uses dynamic resolution scaling just to maintain a 30 FPS average, the fact that we can use dynamic resolution scaling here with a more modern upscaler to get what is effectively a 60 FPS average, this is an overall improvement. And if you look at the used market right now, the prices of PlayStation 4s, suddenly the price of this thing doesn't really seem all that bad. But if I'm being honest, the type of title that I'm far more likely to play on this thing is Monster Hunter Rise. It just tends to run pretty great on all hardware. And with how disappointing Monster Hunter Wilds has been, I'd rather just finally get around to finishing the expansion in this game. And luckily, you could run this game at effectively all of the highest settings. The only thing I would recommend turning down is the fact that if you go with the high graphics settings, it sets a target render resolution of 150%. And while it does look sharper, especially hooked up to a 4K TV, I'd much rather get the performance bump of playing at 1080p. Although I would also recommend maybe just setting it to the average graphic settings in general, as that does have a slight performance bump. And I think that for this title, you really would rather just get the highest FPS possible. But still, I could easily play like this without any real issues. And speaking of titles that you can play effectively remastered, here we have the Halo Master Chief Collection running Halo Reach, one of my absolute favorites in the entire franchise. It's what I grew up with. It was, at least to me, the peak of Halo. And the fact that I'm able to play it on what is a console that can run it at higher than what I originally played this at, with a high refresh rate gaming experience, and the fact that I'm able to play all types of different titles with this device is just all around a win. Yes, you can play this off of the Game Pass on pretty much any Xbox console, and it'll be a great experience, but you are far more limited in the types of titles that you can play on consoles that are that old. <laughs> With this, I'm able to boot up this title as well as brand new titles released today on the same device. That's just not really something you can do with every Xbox out there. Of course, this system is rocking the Radeon 680M graphics chip, which is essentially just a juiced up version of the graphics chip that is in the Steam Deck. So this is more powerful than the Steam Deck, but unfortunately, when you're playing at 1080p or God forbid 1440p or 4K, you have a lot more to render than a 800p little display. So while we do on paper have more raw performance than the Steam Deck, there's a lot of titles that won't perform as well as they would on the Steam Deck's native resolution. Abiotic Factor was one of those titles where I ended up seeing some pretty bad performance overall, even at the lowest graphics settings. I, of course, didn't turn off the global illumination of you do turn that off that is going to give you a pretty big bump in performance but it takes away so much from from the aesthetic of the game itself that i just don't recommend doing that but in extremely dense areas you are looking at sub 30 fps levels of performance if you leave on global illumination but i do think that it's not worth it to sacrifice global illumination what you're better off doing is sacrificing some resolution by turning down the render resolution scale down to around 80 percent you can get a nice bump in performance without really even sacrificing any noticeable visual quality. Even 90%, if you are starting to notice some fuzziness, can give you a nice little boost. And it's just going to keep the game more consistent, which is really the thing that you want the most. Going below 30 can feel absolutely awful. So having the wiggle room here for a very small reduction in resolution does not seem all that bad to me. Especially because of the stylization of this game, you can sacrifice some resolution in and still get a great experience. My personal recommendation is dropping it down to 80%, but if you're sensitive to that kind of thing, 90% and you're still gonna get a nice bump in performance. Of course, you can gradually change it, so you don't need to be hardline about these numbers. If you want 92%, 93%, you can of course do that. But it does show the limitations of the hardware here because of the fact that RDNA 2 is just not as powerful as RDNA 3 and 3.5. Of course, one of the benefits 
of using a system like this is also the fact that you don't just get a console, you also get a full desktop experience. So here I'm loaded into the desktop mode and I'm just using Firefox while watching a YouTube video. I'm using the picture in picture and this is usually how I end up using my PCs anyway. And the performance like this is going to be spectacular because we are using of course a Ryzen 7 6800H. That's fantastic levels of performance. We have 32 gigabytes of RAM. So this is a great desktop experience. This is the kind of thing where I think that Linux PCs end up excelling at. It's just if you live in a browser, there's a good chance that Linux can do 99% of what you want it to do. So there you have it. The performance on it is pretty decent. Obviously, it's not going to be as competitive as some of the higher end APUs that you can get nowadays, but you are going to be spending significantly more money. In fact, I am going to be doing a price to performance comparison between this and some of its higher end siblings out there so that we can really figure out where exactly a system like this falls in terms of value. But at less than $300, this is a very nice SteamOS based gaming console that will effectively let you play a lot of older titles at higher settings than what the consoles of those eras would really allow. You know, if you've ever wanted to play games from the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 era at full 1080p resolution with higher graphics settings than what those consoles would support, then, well, that's what these things are. And you might think that that's a crazy idea, but go right now on eBay, go onto whatever website you like to use to buy used stuff. Look at the prices of an Xbox 360 or a PlayStation 3 right now. Look at the price of the games. Now, why exactly would you go and buy those original consoles to play those older titles at very low resolutions, very low graphic settings when you can just buy this and you don't even have to do anything with emulation. These are games that were natively ported to PC that give you far more control over your graphics settings. And if you are the tinkering type, you can mod them. You will never be able to mod Skyrim on the Xbox 360 in any meaningful capacity. Meanwhile, with Skyrim on PC, on this system, well, you could just as easily mod it to be the type of game that they're trying to get banned on Steam right now. I absolutely love this thing. What I would also do, though, is I would install Moonlight on here just so that when it's set up right underneath my TV, I can directly access my gaming PC to play games at far more demanding settings that would fit more appropriately with a 4K TV. While this is perfectly fine for most of the indie games that I would realistically want to play on my TV anyway, you know, think things like Bellatro and Buckshot Roulette, those are really more like the type of games that I like to sit back and play with a controller. But in the odd occasion that I would want to play a more high-end AAA title with Moonlight, I can just essentially stream it onto here without any issues at all. So if you're interested in making one of these yourself, again, check out the links down below. It is on sale right now, so you can pick up an entire setup for this for not all that much money. That said, I would also recommend this Lenovo controller that I picked up on AliExpress. It was kind of just super cheap. It was less than $20, so I figure, okay, if it's half decent, that's pretty all right. But uh, it's actually pretty nice. I actually like it. I, I didn't think that it would run off of a battery because it feels super light in the hand. I mean, the battery that they have in here for sure is not very big. Yeah, it's 600 milliamp hours. So, you know, not the largest ever, but you really don't need it to have too much. You can just charge it super easily with the USB-C there. I've mostly been using this on my Android devices, but I did try it out with this setup and uh, it was it was pretty nice. I like it. For the package here, the, the cost of just this, you know, one essentially console setup with the 32 gigabytes of RAM, 512 gigabyte SSD, you're looking at about $300. Now, okay, you might think that that's very expensive considering the fact that this thing isn't the most powerful thing out there, but what else is going to be better at this price point? At the form factor that this is, where it's smaller than the controller itself, what beats it? Look at the price of the Xbox 360. Look at the price of the PlayStation 3. Look at the price of the Wii. You can play tons of games from that era on here at great settings. 
You're also able to play modern indie games, so you're not locked into a console that essentially can only ever play a, a existing library. Now, I get it that there is something about owning the actual hardware, owning the physical games, that is part of the ritual of all of this. I get that. I'm not going to sit here and disparage people that want to collect older consoles because I get it. But if you're just looking to play those games, right, if you just never got around to playing them as a kid and you just want to have the best possible experience in these games where the game itself is more important than all of the physical aspects of it what console it's running on and the fact that it's being played off of a physical disc or anything like that if all of that doesn't matter to you and you just want to play the games this is a great solution for that and with things like moonlight you can make this a far more functional environment than just a console that you'll only use for indie games and and other niche titles. There's a lot of value here for sure, especially at this price point, you're just not gonna get anything that will give you the same level of price to performance. But anyways, I will be linking all of this down below, so check it out. I'm currently dealing with a cold, so I'm sorry if my voice just sounded horrific in this, but hopefully I'll get better in the next couple of days. But I'll see you guys next time.